Awesome, great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in a little later than usual. Uh, thank you especially to Arwa for helping me organize this around other engagements. Um, like it says on the tin, today I'll walk you through some dental nonmetrics and biodistance analysis, uh, which is a very specific subfield of bioanthropology. Um, along with age of death estimation, you could argue that it's the most statistically heavy subfield, but I'll try to keep this side fairly light today and focus on a more general overview and some fun practical applications. Um, hopefully I won't bore you with too much general information, but I find that I have a tendency to go into way too much detail and people's souls do leave their bodies at this point. So for your sake, um, I'll, I'll try and keep like an even, even ground at this, uh, in this sense. And if you have any questions about any specific method, site, anything, just uh, uh, we can talk about those afterwards uh, in more detail. All right, and this goes without saying, I'm sure, but there will be images of human remains, uh, mostly teeth though, uh, but just so that you are warned. <clears throat> so let's get started. Uh, Biodistance studies are among the oldest branches of bioanthropological investigations. Uh, they spurred from the taxonomy system first introduced by Linné uh, back in the 1700s. The first version of this taxonomy of humans described geographical differences, but later uh, personality and cognitive traits were also included. And you could say that the past of biodistance studies is fairly unsavory to say the least, uh, because this was heavily entwined with uh, now outdated ideas of race as well. Uh, the most notable, or you could also say notorious person from these early days was um, Sir Francis Galton who was the half cousin of Charles Darwin, I think, um, who coined the term eugenics, which then had a huge impact on political ideologies and even government policies. And Galton led a lab at uh, the University College of London, UCL, and that produced a lot of study studies on cranial shapes uh, using uh, metric information mostly, uh, trying to map out differences between populations and time periods. Um, and what's interesting also for maybe some of you people is the, um, is the fact that Sir Flinders Petrie, um, a renowned Egyptologist, uh, also provided Galton with a lot of study material, uh, not just from Egypt, uh, but also from different Levantine sites. And um, although not everyone agreed with Galton's views, even at the time that he was making these um, propositions, um, the move towards the kind of bioarchaeology and biodistance study that we do now and what we know now only took place um, after the Second World War, uh, when the physical appearance of the skeleton was approached from a slightly different perspective. It was seen more as a function, functional system, and um, anthropologists started to ask the question, why is the, the body the way it is instead of just describing what it looks like. Um, Biodistance analysis rests on the assumption that physical appearance acts, acts as a proxy for genetic, genetic data and that more closely related people also look more alike. Uh, this extends not just to soft tissue features, we all get commented on at family re reunions, uh, but uh, also our skeletons. The emergence and ease of using DNA has really changed the field of biodistance studies. Uh, what started off as a comparison of shape uh, by people like Galton, for instance, uh, and assuming similarity always means proximity, uh, we can now test uh, these shapes alongside genetic information. Uh, not all features of the skeleton are equally reliable as we've come to understand through these uh, studies between uh, DNA and shape um, because the, the shape of the skeleton is also altered by external factors like environment. Uh, and the more traditional techniques 
uh, while while they are not um, okay, let's put it like this. Um, so the more traditional techniques, uh, like the ones that I just mentioned with the with the with the shape and all, um, while those are while those are in in a way out not as useful as DNA, they have remained popular and in use um, because they are non-destructive and sometimes biochemical preservation is too poor for DNA analysis. Uh, so in this sense, it's still good to have several different uh, techniques in place that you can, you can just reach into your toolkit and say like, okay, this is my material. What can I do to make the best of it? And, um, and the good thing is that even though I say traditional techniques, uh, like the ones that I'm going to talk about in, in a moment, I only really do refer to the longevity of these types of analyses because the field has by no means been stagnant during this time. Uh, my most recent research focused on teeth because of this very real issue of preservation that I mentioned previously. Uh, this skull, for instance, is from a site in the Nile Delta. It's about 3,500 years old. And during that time, because of regular inundation, the water has washed away a lot of the minerals, leaving the bones soft and susceptible to distortion due to soil pressure. Uh, you can see uh, exactly how much the skull has not only squished, but skewed and even fractured uh, the bone uh, is soft to the touch and the original bone surface is almost completely flaked off. Uh, and you can imagine how this skull is not a good candidate to either DNA or any kind of biochemical uh, analysis um, or, or cranial by distance analysis either for that matter. matter. Uh, but uh, if you look more closely, you can see the teeth uh, which still, although they do have some taphonomic changes and where uh, in comparison to the rest of the skull, they're still pretty okay. And this is because teeth are mostly made out of min mineral, um, about 95% uh, for the enamel, uh, 45 to 50 for cementum and 70% for dentine. Uh, and this makes them very durable. Uh, Teeth are among the most informative singular elements of the skeleton uh, to do any kind of osteobiographical study because they give clues about diet, uh, about health, congenital conditions, ancestry, and so on. Uh, teeth have become increasingly popular in biodistance analysis as well because the features seen on them are more heavily governed by genetic uh, genetics and they change slowly in populations. Uh, there are several ways to use teeth for biodistance. Um, I'll be focusing on non-metric data, but I did want to mention a couple of other techniques that are also widely used. And these are metric, metric analysis and something called geometric morphometrics. Uh, the latter is particularly lightly treaded, um, a lightly treaded path of investigation at the moment, uh, but there's more and more studies um, in the, or there have been more and more studies in the past, past few years. Uh, in a classic metric analysis, two dimensions are recorded using something like sliding calibers, for instance, uh, while geometric morphometrics take, um, take this one step further by digitizing the tooth uh, to create a two or three dimensional shape uh, to compare the relationship of different features. Uh, here you see how the tooth shape has been reproduced from a photo. So the, the middle one is the photo. Uh, and then that has been turned into a digital um, just shape on the right hand side of the slide. And by doing this to each individual, uh, you can start to compare shape differences. Um, metric methods are attractive as they are not reliant on the observations made by the investigator, uh, rather because um, rather they are, they are measured. 
and this makes them more objective. Uh, the challenge, however, is that they require good preservation uh, for, the, for the material and nowhere. And this is definitely not the case for a lot of archaeological material. And even to the, the tooth that, that you see here in, this, in the middle picture is uh, probably from a six-year-old. And in my experience for Middle Bronze Age sites in, in places like Sidon, for instance, you start to see wear on the tooth already on seven, eight-year-old children. So that makes it difficult. Um, so, so that's why dental nometrics offer a very good alternative. As the name suggests, uh, they are traits that are not measured. Uh, this means that you can't use a ruler. Um, they are features on the surface of the tooth uh, that are observed with a bare eye. And they're either marked as present or absent, or they're graded on a scale to show how prominent they are. Dental features can refer to the presence or absence of cusps or roots or extra grooves on the enamel surface. Um, one tooth can have multiple different features. Uh, and here I've, I've given you an example of the, so the, the box indicates all the different um, traits that you can identify one from the first upper molar alone. Uh, and uh, here you can see some of them in place. So that would be the size of the metacone cusp, hypocone cusp. Uh, you have potentially some people have also a cusp five between these two. You can have extra marginal uh, tubercles on the uh, mesial side. And then you can also have a carabelli cusp. So the molar is cusp central, basically. It likes to have cusps. And these are all very useful in these biodistance studies. Uh, Arizona State University Dental Anthropology System uh, is by far the most utilized method uh, to study dental nonmetrics. Uh, there are currently about 100 different dental features that can be recorded from teeth, uh, both in humans or, or what are they called? Um, modern humans, as well as different um, other species or, or hominins. Uh, however, the Asuda system only has about 40 traits selected. And uh, these traits have been selected because they are considered to have a strong hereditary component, um, at least moderate toleration to wear, um, and little to no sexual dimorphism. Uh, Asudas has been developed for several decades now. Uh, during which time the system has gone through many rounds of standardization, uh, trying to bring uniformity in the way investigators see the traits. Uh, which, and this has been done by producing casts and writing long detailed descriptions and offering photographic manuals. Uh, the, the one on the left is definitely my favorite and I, I highly recommend it to anyone interested. Uh, and I've actually also included an example of the casts and photos for you on the on the right, so you can see upper upper second incisor shoveling. Uh, this is the cast that you would get uh, on the top, and then this is how you would grade it um, depending on how strong that feature is on the tooth. And then here is below, here you can see a photo of a tooth that does have a little bit of that, that shape. So you have those raised margins on both sides. Mm -mm. Um, and this is done because inter-observer rel reliability is one of the biggest uh, challenges or risks, risk factors uh, when using non-metric data and, and recording non-metric data because it is completely reliant on the investigator and how they see the traits. And um, in addition to subjectivity, uh, missing, missing information is another challenge with non-metric data, uh, as, as with all archeological material, really. 
uh, it might not be possible to score a feature because the tooth is too worn or it's just simply missing altogether. I mean, we've, we've all seen those um, museum collections where basically all the front teeth are gone because they are, they're one rooted. And so, you know, you keep the skull uh, right side up and the teeth just fall off and never to be found again. Uh, so it's a real shame. Uh, but here uh, I've actually, I've also attached um, a little example from you from an actual data file that I have. Uh, the rows in this table uh, represent individuals and the columns are different traits. And all those blank spaces are missing data. So you can just, you can see how much information is, is potentially lost uh, when, when you have archeological data and, and these kinds of, these kinds of cases. Um, and this becomes a challenge for the next step where this raw data is turned into actual um, analysis and, 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 and actual biodistances then. Uh, there is a slew of different statistical tools to choose from. Um, and, this is, and this list here is by no means even close to being exhaustive, um, but it's just to give you an idea of what is, what is out there. Uh, the first one, um, Pearson's uh, CRL, is on this list, uh, basically just as I mentioned, because it is one of the first ones, if not the first, um, test uh, created to assess biodistance. But uh, it has some statistical uh, shortcomings, so it's no longer in use. So there are other ones. Uh, in, and actually the rest of the ones mentioned here are currently in use and very popular among investigators. Uh, these are all multivariate statistical methods, uh, which means that um, you have a large amount of variables uh, and in this case, dental traits that together define how similar or dissimilar uh, individuals or groups are. So instead of just saying, you know, you have two variables and you can easily plot them uh, close to or far away from each other, now you all of a sudden you have 15 traits and you, you simply, you cannot see in 15 dimensions. So that's why we do these kind of distance analyses and distance, distance matrices so that we can, we can understand multidimensional data in a way that you know, we can, for instance, visually observe. And this is, this is what's been done on the graph on the right. Uh, each of these methods approaches the data a little bit differently. Uh, and this is dependent, and this is really then dependent on the type of data that you have, uh, what is your research question, whether you're looking at groups or individuals, uh, if you have a lot of missing data. Um, but overall, all these, all these statistical tools uh, produce very similar results, which is obviously we're very good <laughs> because otherwise we might have some issues. So all in all, um, biodistance analysis can be very complex because uh, there are many steps to take between data collection and the results, uh, just to even just to ensure good quality. Uh, but it also makes it a very interesting and exciting type of analysis. And depending on the question, you can use the data to zoom from individuals. Uh, all the way to global trends or even explore human evolution. Um, so um, dental non-metric traits have been recorded with the SUDAs for decades uh, from sites across the world uh, to create regional frequency tables and explore the most informative traits for biodistance analysis. In many cases, however, you can often see a gap in information when it comes to the Western Asia, 
Uh, this has improved in the last decade or so, but as the recording has only recently begun to increase, uh, these studies still cover a wide range, both regionally and temporally, uh, which has its own pros, pros and cons. On one hand, it gives a very good overview of the region to see what kind of traits are common and what are not. Uh, but on the other, um, comparisons then within that region between sites are difficult uh, if the data isn't from the same time period, because you can't see synchronous moments in time, you're, you can't really say whether, you know, there was um, a lot of intermarital connections between two sites if you're not looking at the same time period. Um, so the importance of the bioarchaeological framework is very apparent in biodistance analyses because the results often gain meaning only when you consider them holistically uh, together with as much of the archeological contextual information as possible. Uh, the, exa the examples I've chosen today come from the Middle Bronze Age, a time period that also covers the ancient Egyptian second intermediate period. Uh, and this was an, an, an era of increased everything, everything you can think of. Um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, settlements increased both in size and number. Uh, they became more urbanized and complex. Uh, communities became more stratified and um, e inequality in terms of wealth became visible, particularly in the larger sites. Uh, trade network works grew as well, uh, extending all the way from Anatolia to Egypt and were directed by commerce rather than polities, as, as I've understood. Uh, commodities traveled from port to port and further inland through trade routes. Some of these settlements were large regional centers that attracted trade not, not just to them, but through them, uh, while others were smaller and provided more limited items and had less traffic. These networks, of course, also have implications to migration and mobility, both of which are inherent to humans. The emergence uh, or spread of certain cultural markers, um, such, as, such as certain pottery types in new locations uh, has been used to argue for migration and sometimes for cultural diffusion. Um, and where the material culture can ignite this debate of pots versus people, uh, by immersing human remains from these contexts into the, into the discussion, we can offer more insight to the populations and the settlements uh, in, into settlement developments and maybe uh, whether there was actually migration or just uh, an exchange of ideas. Uh, to think about these Middle Bronze Age connections and the variation between sites, I've chosen an example from ancient Egypt and one from Jordan. Uh, these are studies done in collaboration with other investigators. Um, and this is, this is honestly the best way to do things in my opinion. Uh, one of the articles is still in press, um, both, but both of the ones mentioned here are open access for anyone interested. And the one coming out uh, shortly is also going to be open access in the Bioarchaeology of the Near East uh, Journal. The following examples have been based around dental nonmetric data using mainly two different statistical methods, uh, mean measure of divergence and Gower co coefficients. These were selected because they are forgiving of missing data, which you may guess is a major challenge with the with the material as old as this. Uh, MMD uses frequency tables, which means you are looking at groups instead of individuals. Uh, it's very robust and has been used for decades, uh, but small sample sizes can bias results. Uh, so sometimes traits have to be excluded from the analysis because uh, their recording rate is too low, um, basically under, under 10. Uh, Gower coefficients, on the other hand, create a distance estimation for each individual. Um, and so you can also, in, 
in addition to looking at differences between groups, you can also look at the variation within your group as well. So you can, for instance, um, if you are seeing a lot of difference in diversity between males and females of your sample, uh, you might have a case of sex-based uh, marriage practices. Um, however, like with the MMD analysis, uh, small samples can be bias the results with Gower as well. Uh, my first example comes from ancient Egypt, uh, from the end of the Middle Kingdom and Second Intermediate Period, from the ancient town of Avaris, ruled by the so-called Hyksos. Uh, Hyksos is a Greek term deriving from the ancient Egyptian Hekau Hasut, meaning rulers of foreign lands. Uh, the Egyptians used Hekau Hasut for any foreign ruler, but during the Second Intermediate Period uh, and later, it had a particularly uh, a particular reference to a group that had its own little sovereign in northern Egypt in the Delta area. Uh, the Hyksos capital is known today by many names, uh, most commonly as either Abaris or Tel Aldaba. The former, again, is a Greek name uh, for the site, while the latter refers to a nearby modern set settlement. Um, during the Hyksos rule, the town was known as Hutuaret. Uh, the Hyksos period, marked even in the Egyptian Turin king list, only lasted for about a century, ending as Thebans, Theban rulers seized the town and united the land of Egypt under one ruler again. Uh, but they had a great impact on ancient Egyptian culture, ranging from language to religion to technology. Uh, and up until the mid 20th century, our understanding of the Hyksos was mostly reliant on textual sources, uh, particularly the accounts given by the historian Manetho. And Manetho uh, is believed to have been a priest and a historian during the Ptolemaic period, um, authoring a book called Egyptiaca, um, The History of Egypt, which has been a major source of information about Egyptian kings. Um, according to Manetho, the Hexes were an obscure race from the east uh, invading Egypt and dismantling the Middle Kingdom rule. So not a nice group of people. However, uh, there are a few issues with sources like Manetho. Um, first off, the time difference between the event and the account. Um, the second intermediate period, which is when the Hyksos ruled, is much, much earlier than the Ptolemaic period during which Manetho wrote his account. Uh, what's also um, good to note is that none of Manetho's original works have survived. Uh, and his, writing, his writings are only known to us through the texts of even later historians, such as the historian Flavius Josephus, who lived during the Roman period. And you can imagine how all these events could cause a broken telephone effect. The discovery of Avaris and the subsequent decades long excavations have produced an immense cache of information about the second intermediate period and the Hyksos. Uh, we now know that the town was founded during the 12th dynasty to serve Egypt's interests in the Eastern Mediterranean trade network. Uh, this is evident from the, or you could argue that this is also um, evident from the oldest name of the, of the town, Rawati, which translates roughly to mouth of two ways, uh, high, highlighting how it sat in the connection po point of both maritime and land trade routes. Egypt had strong re trade relations to the Levant at least since the Old Kingdom, when it was trading particularly with Biblos, uh, located in modern Lebanon. There are a lot of different types of sources from the Middle Kingdom, indicating that foreigners were coming to Egypt um, through both voluntary and forced migration routes. Amu, uh, translated as Asiatic, is the Egyptian term used for people from this area. Uh, inscriptions found at Serabit el Khadim on the Sinai trade route suggest Egyptians were also using locals in mining expeditions um, at the tomb of Knun Hotep II uh, here in this 
this, this image is from that tomb, um, who was believed to have been in charge of prospecting mining activities. Um, his, his tomb depicts a procession of Asiatic families traveling, potentially traveling to Egypt. Uh, so for our study, uh, multiple cemeteries have been found from Avaris. Uh, we were able to sample individuals from th three different areas, um, A1, A2, and F1 uh, circled here. The samples were mostly from A2, uh, the largest cemetery at the site and the most published one. The samples dated from the very end of the Middle Kingdom to the end of the Hyksos period. Uh, so unfortunately, we do not have um, information or, or biological data from the very earliest phases of occupation. Uh, a colleague of mine, Chris Dantis, used uh, the samples for, for strontium isotope analysis to investigate mobility. Sampling was done on second molars, uh, which formed during late childhood to avoid breastfeeding and weaning signatures. Uh, the local strontium value for Avaris was established from animal remains using two standard deviations around the mean as the range for locals. Uh, this is where most values for from other Egyptian sites fall into as well. So you see here the upper and the lower. And more than half of the individuals from the Avara sample, uh, so 40 out of 75 that we were able to sample, fell outside of the local Egyptian is strontium isotope signature range. Uh, the isotope results could also be utilized in the biodistance analysis. A comparison between locals and non-locals uh, showed no difference between these two groups, suggesting that they had similar ancestry. Uh, much like in the isotope study, uh, groups could not be divided into smaller um, into smaller groups um, depending on locality, such as the the, the burial area or time period or sex, um, but since the locals and non-locals showed basically no difference between them, it was possible to pull them together and compare to other Egyptian sites. Uh, this analysis was done using mean measure of divergence, which I mentioned earlier, and the distance, ma distance matrix was plotted um, graphically using a dimension reduction technique that condenses this multi-dimensional data into something that you can observe in two dimensions. Um, here, this graph on the right, uh, you can see that Avaris does not cluster with any of the other Egyptian sites. And on average, it was seven standard deviations away from the other from the Egyptian sites. And if you remember the, uh, the, the isotopes, two standard deviations was already indicating significant statistical difference. So the sample that we have from Avaris is much different from the Egyptian samples. So in short, um, Avaris, one of the largest trade hubs of the Middle Bronze Age Eastern Mediterranean, had a large portion of non-locals who ancestrally resembled the locals. Um, either the migration to the site started at an earlier period uh, that we cannot see because we don't have samples from those from that period, or people of Asiatic ancestry are already living in Egypt uh, due to various reasons were moving to the site from somewhere else in Egypt. Uh, both options are entirely possible and it and the truth is potentially possible somewhere in between the two as well. Uh, okay, so where Avaris was a prominent trade center with strong signs of mobility and migration, other contemporary regions were more marginal. Uh, in the Northeast from Egypt, in the area of modern Jordan, signs of mobility are more modest uh, but this could also be a result of fewer, fewer available studies. Uh, Middle Bronze Age studies are lacking completely from this area or were lacking completely. Um, recently, uh, 
we had an opportunity to study material from, an, from the ancient site of Pella, excavated by Professor Stephen Burke from the University of Sydney. Uh, during the Middle Bronze Age, Pella has been called gateway settlement, uh, linking the Mediterranean coastlands and the Jor Jordanian uplands. The size of Pella is within the mid-range of Middle Bronze Age sites, but the heavy fortif fortifications and the luxury items found from tombs at the site suggest uh, it had some, at least some significance in the Middle Bronze Age trade network. Pella's most notable artifactual similarities are shared with the, with the coastal town of Tel el Ajul, uh, which is also among the many sites speculated to have been uh, Sharuchen, uh, the last Hyksa stronghold. Middle Bronze Age burials in Pella were mostly ovoid single chamber tombs in various states of preservation. Um, all had some effects from water damage. Many tombs contained multiple individuals. Uh, tomb 62 is worth noting in particular as this three chamber tomb contained over 2000 objects and the commingled remains of approximately 100 to 150 individuals, which is probably makes it one of the largest communal burials in, in the region and in the time period. Um, most of our study material came from this tomb as well. Uh, for both isotope and biodistance analysis, we use the same individual teeth to avoid double sampling the individuals because these teeth really were, they were commingled. Uh, there was no way to tell whether whether what belonged to whom, it was just so. So you you, you do what you can basically. Uh, this was quite a limitation to the usual information that we have available, um, as every individual became represented by a single lower second molar. Uh, because of this analysis, focused heavily on individuals. Um, the biodistance analysis was conducted using Gower co coefficients this time, which is the one where you can compare individuals or where you can look at individuals rather than just groups. Uh, Chris's strontium and oxygen isotopes were plotted together, uh, which su suggested that there was only four potential non-locals, uh, all from the large tomb 62. Uh, and then if you only look at strontium values, which derive, and strontium values derive from the bedrock, the number of non-locals drops even more. Um, however, strontium values throughout this region are pretty similar. Uh, so identifying non-locals could be uh, quite a challenge, which is exemplified here as well. Uh, this is something that Chris, Chris recently produced. Uh, this is a wonderful plot that shows all the strontium data, data of the region. Uh, I mean, you could wax poetry from this for a whole afternoon, but I'll just focus on Pella uh, for the moment. And you can find this from the paper as well. Um, and you can see how similar the Pella values are with the surrounding regions. So you have Pella here highlighted in blue, and then Sidon on one side, Babadra on the other. Um, obviously, Teladab, some Teladaba values, <laughs> some Teladaba values are on the same level. And then further out, you also have a lot of the Habur Basin values as well. So it's it's looking fairly homogeneous altogether. Uh, for the biodistance analysis, uh, the distance matrix was created from the second lower molar uh, dental traits and analyzed using two different clustering techniques. Uh, this was just to see if if the um, if we can get similar results and and not just get some kind of statistical or mathematical fluke. Um, so for this, I used partitioning around metoids, which is here on the left, and hierarchical cluster analysis on the right, uh, and which creates a tree. And I'm sure that everybody has seen some kind of tree analysis at some point. And these are, these are basically the same type of clustering. It's just, it approaches the, the data slightly differently. 
uh, both analyses divided the individuals into similar clusters. So regardless of which one I used, uh, the, the individuals that looked more alike, they always, they, they formed their own cluster, which is good news because it means that it's, we're, we're seeing, we're likely seeing real differences, not just something that has just happened, accidentally happens to, happens to happen because of the statistic used. Um, what is interesting is that the tomb 62, 62 individuals uh, spread very wide in this analysis, while the two primary burials from this, of this analysis, so burials 28 and 106 here on the red group, uh, they clustered together with two other tomb 62 individuals and everybody else was somewhere else and did something different. And even on this, uh, on this tree, you can see that uh, 28 and 106 are kind of, they form their own little branch and then everything else is here, down here. Um, so despite isotopically looking quite similar, the teeth indicated more morphological and then maybe also potentially ancestral, ancestral diversity in this group. Um, it's also pertinent to remember that isotopes and biodistance do not answer the same question. One maps movement during a person's lifetime, so that's the isotopes, uh, while biodistance is ancestry, it's, it's lineage, it's, it's generational, it's her hereditary, so it's different. Uh, and it's possible that the homogeneity of the bedrock hides some of this mobility, but um, the biodistance analysis conducted here is also fairly limited because we are only using one tooth and the, the, the traits available in those tooth. So it could potentially exaggerate some of those differences. However, when you think about the archeological context as well, it's, it gets really interesting uh, because um, tomb 62, like I said, was commingled uh, which made it very challenging to assign context to some of the finds. Uh, this also affects the dating uh, because currently tomb 62 has been dated on a range from middle bronze age to early late bronze age. Uh, it's also possible that it represents a large cache uh, where the remains from, other, from the other uh, rock carved tombs were cleared into uh, to make space for new people. Uh, but in either case, the archaeological and bioarchaeological evidence from Pella uh, is at least somewhat contesting this view of Jordan as a simply marginal area. Um, in addition to being the largest tomb in Pella, Tomb 62 also has some of the most interesting material finds, including some Hyksos scarabs. Um, some of these scarabs even mention uh, rulers known from the king lists. Uh, and these are very rare indeed. Uh, and interestingly, uh, Egyptian presence in Pella also increases after the Hyksos period, I think during the late Bronze Age. So clearly there is some, some very strong interest to this area and happening in this area. And um, yeah, there's, uh, there are some, Although we, uh, we were able to kind of open the door on some of these questions, we, we definitely let out more questions than we actually answered. But this is this is just what makes research exciting and, and fun. So from these two examples, you can see how movement varied between sites uh, during the Middle Bronze Age. Um, although both Avaris and Pella have been categorized as gateway or regional centers, um, they had they were very different in size uh, with Avaris with its 250 hectares towering over Pella's six hectares, I think. Um, this is also evident in the drastically different numbers of locals and non-locals that were identified with the isotopes analysis. Um, I've also, I've only provided two examples uh, in, this, in this presentation, but the Middle Bronze Age is full of potential sites and I'm sure more studies will come out in the future that will help us understand both regional and interregional movement. 
uh, which will in turn provide more information on the causes and effects of migration um, that can be used to understand even the universal phenomena of human migration and mobility. And we can do this by incorporating human remains into these research questions and employing the entire toolkit available for osteoarchaeologists. And so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there, I obviously, there are more examples for you guys if you want to hear. I think I have, I, I remember I, I, I mentioned that there are, you can use even individuals to look at biodistance or you can all you use all the way to global trends. So I think I have one example of an individual. Uh, however, that's a Roman case. So doesn't really quite get, get into the, it's, it's in the right corner of the world, but not quite. And then I also have some um, examples from the Habur Basin. However, these are Calcolithic and early Bronze Age, but I'm also, I'm very happy to talk about those as well, if you're interested. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Arwa, so much for the invitation. And uh, obviously, thank you to all the collaborators um, and, and colleagues, because these are joint efforts and it's the only, only, only way that we're gonna make any, any exciting new, new research, I think in the future is by collaborating as much as possible and really thinking about things in, from multiple perspectives. Thank you.